We need white to clean up that plasma coil. The stuff that makes pollen is stupid plants. <laughs> stupid plants. I hate green because plants. <laughs> I used to get allergies rolling around in grass as a kid, which when you're a kid, that's like the worst thing, right? And I never knew what it was. It went away. I, I could roll around in grass now, I think, without any problem. Not something I do every day, but... I used to be like, I hate grass. Grass is horrible. Makes me all itchy. But more than just like itchy, I like get like, you know, I joke about breaking out in hives. You like break out in hives. That like bumps all over your skin. It's horrible. My mom was convinced it was like uh, the fertilizer. Probably was. Or back in the day, what was it, DDT? What was it that we we had all the time? With the bug spray and all that. Not fertilizer, but pesticides. Was it DDT? I feel like DDT stands out to me because it's a punk rock thing. The band's called DDT. It was DDT. Deet. Deet? It's the deets. That's what you asked the, the girls at the club for. Yo, girl, can I get you deets? Isn't that right? Or am I showing my age? That's not how kids talk at all these days, probably. <laughs> Morior Invictus, what is going on? Thank you for that follow. Welcome, welcome. I swear to God, we're going to be painting plasma. Well, technically, we're painting plasma coil, so I don't have to. I don't have to make excuses anymore. He with this white base is it needs to be up inside each of these divots because remember, light sources don't get shadow the way your normal painting does. And so the first part you gotta do is turn your head on its tail and remind your brain that you're not painting normally here. Right? We also wanna catch this area where we've been doing that edge highlight. I'm gonna get it. Run up with that white. Oh. Like you're like, what is he doing? It looks like it's already glowing. Yeah, cameras and white guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, but because it's a light source, you're not going to have shadows in between the coils, and that's that's one of the biggest things that I see people getting or you know struggling with as they do OSL of all types. Is that if you're painting flame, I see people that paint flame and the flame has a shadow to it instead of its brightest area being down where you would normally paint darkness. And so you really have to kind of think, at least plan ahead, you know, if you want to do it that way. Do you want to have it look more like a traditional light source, in which case you really do need to uh, amp up the value of whatever color you're doing. We're going to be doing like, you know, uh, I'm thinking a reddish hot pink kind of a glow on this because it's Jen. And Jen likes pink things. Take this down real low. You can still see the idea is that we just don't want any shadow in between any of the ribs of the plasma coil. We want to make sure that they all stay bright in between because we're actually going to be painting darker colors on the tops of the plasma coil, right? Again, you're flipping things on its head or end over what you're used to when you go in and do these light sources. But that's what really gives it the right read. Now, I like the plasma coils with the brightness down towards the, the barrel of the gun as opposed to up on the top, but you can do it any way. Uh, if you're doing plasma coils very quickly, you can paint them your base color like you would normally and then highlight towards like the middle of it so it makes it look like there's maybe a pulse going along the length of the, 
the ribs, you know, from, from back here at the energy pack out towards the barrel. So you can have a bright spot kind of moving through in the middle and then blend it out to darker color at the edges. I tend to like the idea that these are fluorescent tubes and they're glowing from kind of the bottom and then, you know, wrapping around. So there's a, a general power source that runs all the way through it all the time. But it's up to you. We'll do that kind here. And then the other kind is very easy. Especially if you have an airbrush, you can just kind of airbrush a hot spot on the plasma coil. Uh, so what do we want to do here? I think what I would like to start with is some red transparent paint. Can't get easier than that, right? So transparent red. You're not a pesticidologist? Is that a thing? D and DDT are two different things? I feel like yes. <laughs> yeah, DDT, like Blue Diamonds is right. Like DDT killed everything, I think, right? Like, DDT was not just, it was a pesticide in the broadest sense of the, the word. Like, is your neighbor a pest? Because I hear DDT, right? <laughs> is that dog over there a pest? Because DDT. I feel like that's why it's not around anymore. <laughs> Bear, what's going on? Lou's like, I'm just a chemistry nerd. Nothing wrong with that, man. Russ says your allergies got worse as you grew older. You've got uh, HIPAA filters now to filter the air in your house. Yeah. I've been the opposite. I, I knock wood, right? I haven't, I haven't had allergies get worse. I've had them get better, but I've moved to dry climates. In, in the uh, the moist climates, right? The humid climates like Texas, New York, right? Those areas, I always had real bad problems. It was like twice a year, I would I would get, uh, let's see if I can put it better for you. I would get uh, like strep throat, you know, sinus infections, allergies. Oh, I was always awful. Twice a year, man. It's like once at the change of spring and once the change out of fall. Ugh. All right. Thinking like that, but I want lots thinner. Right? The red transparent, as you break it down and thin it out, you start getting this magenta really quick. That's freaking perfect. So booyah, let's do this. Now, it is going to get darker in the recesses because it's a liquid and it's flowing down in there. And we're going to change that. All right, we're going to have to go back and brighten all of those recesses up again. But for right now, we're okay with it. And look at that, babe. Your plasma gun is hot pink. Again, why we did the white, right? Because knowing, or at least having the fundamental knowledge that I was going to go and do the... Uh, Red transparent pushes us into that that hot pink like bubblegum color super super quick. Now we could keep layering the red transparent on top of all of this and get back to red easily as well. But I'm since we're doing pink, we're going the easy route. Now, I'm not worried about the glow aspect of it yet. I just want to get the coils right. Then we'll work out towards all of the surrounding areas with the glow. Okay. So now what we've done is we've just inverted and gone back to normal painting. We have the darkness in the recesses. right? So we've got to fix that. But this gives the general coloring over the entire surface. Go and continue to... Push that more vibrant coloring on there. Blue Diamonds, thank you so much for the follow and the chemical knowledge. Hey, Lou, you know chemistry, eh? You want to move to New Mexico, close to the desert, buy a school bus? <laughs> <laughs> Haku's lurking. It doesn't work if you tell us that you're lurking.
<laughs> Stop being used because it got transferred to animals and made bird eggs so fragile they couldn't be sat on. Oh, DDT. That show had some surprisingly accurate-ish chemistry bits to it. I was always wondering, like, you know, were they going to get to the point where people understood the mixture for, for meth? And then, you know, not that you need more meth in the world. Like, I feel like everybody already knows, you know, if that's your goal, you, you know how to mix meth, probably. I tried to watch a lot of that, a lot of that show. I couldn't, I couldn't get with it. I, I, um, I stopped after the Los Dos Hermanos guy died. He blew up or whatever. That's when I stopped watching. I never, that was the end of one season and I never went back for the next season. I think at the time it was probably because that season wasn't available on, you know, whatever service I had, streaming service I had, Netflix or whatever the heck it was on. Um, but, yeah, there's that. So now I'm going back with a very, very thin white and shoving white back down into our shadow spots, right? Because we've got to get all that darkness out of there. Doesn't make sense. So it literally is just dragging. I'm, I'm running the white very thin. So that it just drops in there. And then I'll come back over these again. You notice how the ones I did the first time got really bright with the second pass. I'll do two, two or three passes on them. But it's super simple. It's, it's um, you know, this part is really just the, I don't know, the delicate nature of having a brush with a tip on it. I don't know. Is that the right way to say that? I don't know. Get a little outside the lines, it doesn't even matter. But notice my brush stroke is coming from the upper portion and dropping off all of my paint down here at the bottom. Okay. Go ahead and just tie this bottom edge together. So, and already you can see the difference. This starts to look like it's glowing as opposed to this that just like, like it's painted, right? Big difference just by getting and flipping to the negative, right? The photographic negative. If we just took a picture of tubes lined up next to each other, there would be shadows like this, right? In between. But now we flip it on its head and we start shoving light into where the shadows would be and we start getting the basis for our plasma glow and it starts looking like it's actually glowing. That makes your bad plasma coils make so much more sense. It's just a real simple way. It's the lighting that trips everybody up, right? It's the fact that you, you can't have shadows in deep areas on a light source. That's not how light sources work, right? The, the deep areas are generally what's causing the light. That's not to say that's always true. You can have a lamp that has weird shadows from being cast on itself from the bulb, you know, based on the shape of the lamp. So everything is different. But in general, right, when we speak in broad general strokes, the idea is to get rid of that inner shadow and bounce it into brightness. And that's where your glow is going to come from. And you'll notice that as I go and darken up the individual tubes, it starts getting, you know, more and more like a glow. Again. Need more white paint. How could you afford a meth addiction? Plastic crack street price is outrageous. <laughs> yeah, right. It's always the jokes are like, you know, that, well, there's the one that's like, you know, introduce your kids to miniatures at an early age. You'll never have to worry about them, you know, spending their money on drugs and stuff, right? 
And the other joke is teach your kids drugs because it's so much cheaper than miniatures, right? For all you kids out there, I did not just say go do drugs. Don't be flipping that around and telling your parents. So I was watching Slow Fuse the other day, and he had a very compelling argument for my financial future and choosing drugs over miniatures. I don't want to start getting a bunch of emails from parents in the background, right? If you rat me out like that, the tutorials are over. The tutorials are over, dudes. Now, up on top, the idea is that you still want to bring a little bit of that white through in the shadowed areas, but not as much. Otherwise, you lose the vibrancy of that section down low. So up here, I just want to swipe the brush real quick through there so that the darkest bits go away. But I still want it to be darker up on top than I do down low. And that's just because we're, we're choosing to make the glow uh, the foundation for the glow lower, right? So you can start seeing how as we go away from the base, we'll be able to show a little bit more brightness or a little bit less brightness as we go up. Right, right. Chad Michael Taylor. Cannot be trusted. 35 freaking months, man. Chad Michael Taylor in one more month will hit Golden Liar status. So I want to get a moment of silence. Chad Michael Taylor's last month as a simple liar. It's coming. Your time to move on, young man. The Arctic Mini Painting says, so wait, let me get this right. You just said go do drugs, right? <laughs> no. No, that's not what I said at all. As a matter of fact, I said the opposite. Well, I didn't say the opposite of that. Technically, yeah, I think I said something similar to that, but I'm not going to admit, you know, that that's what I said. Don't do drugs, kids. I've never done drugs. So, you know... I smoked pot like a couple times when I was really young. I didn't like it. My parents smoked. Maybe that's why I didn't like it. Because everybody around me, all the adults were smoking. So I was like, meh. I probably spent the first 10 years. My, the joke is that I spent like the first 10 or 12 years of my life side high because my parents were hippies and smoked. Right? And so I just never really got into it. I didn't drink beer until I was like nearly 30 years old. I'm really a prude at heart, really. Oz says, who's Slow Fuse? Is he your dealer? <laughs> He's a good salesperson, that slow fuse guy. Kevrov, golden liar of golden liars. Thank you for that Twitch Prime, by the way. All right, so now I've got white paint and I've got red transparent. So I've got all the tools I need out on the palette. And what we're going to start doing is mixing those two. So I'm going to pull a little bit of red transparent into my white paint so I can get a bright pale pink out of this, right? But it's going to keep me centered on the exact color, right, that my transparent was. And I'm going to use that to paint the top end of these coils. just to knock off the dark red down at the base of the coil here. Look at all the individual coils. These have got, you know, you get a lot of white paint on them when you put the white paint back into the, uh, the shadow areas. So this just puts color back on the, the tube. I'm using the side of the brush here, rather than trying to go in with the tip of the brush and draw each one of those lines. These I'm going to have to do more of a drawing thing on them. 
because they're just too close in to the rest of the barrel. That's just to pull the tubes back out. Pretty good. Go across the top here. Again, just using the side of the brush, drag it across the grain. That'll separate all those out. Much easier than trying to use the tip of the brush to draw a line that may or may not be easy to do. Now, not all sculpts allow you to use the side of the brush, depending on how, uh, how deep this sculpt is with its detailing. Sometimes the sculpts get a little shallow, and if you drag the side of the brush, you wind up getting paint like down in between. But on this one, these plasma coils are pretty good, so we don't wind up throwing color down in between. But now we get a good staged color to work with. Now we'll just start adding more and more of the red transparent into that white. And each stage will get a little bit darker. And it's up to you how many stages you do, just like always. You know, if you want to go and make big, broad jumps into very high value and uh, high contrast, you want to go super dark real quick, test that out. See how it looks. There is no right and wrong. I will tell you that you're going to like it better, like most things when we paint, if you take, you know, smaller jumps. You know, I don't want to go super dark off of that. Uh, as a matter of fact, that may be too dark. This, that's a little bit better. Again, just use the side of the brush, and kind of bring that up, leaving that brighter pink down low. Again, like I said, this is going to flip your brain upside down because you're not used to painting with the shadows up high. You're used to having the shadows be in the recesses and down low. And instead, we're starting to throw darker color up towards the top of this. Boy, this is really hot pink. Jen's going to love this color. Stream there. Dances with cats, what's going on? We are doing great today. I may just jump straight into red now. Let's see. Let's see how this works over on the palette. Pulling a lot more transparent red into my mix over here, and that may get us, yeah, I feel like that's probably right. Don't want a lot of paint. Don't want it dribbling down into our bright recesses if we can avoid it. I'm going to pull it, the darkness down a little bit more on the front and a little bit more on the back. So I give kind of a radial glow, like the glow is stronger in the middle. So it'll give the appearance that my brighter color kind of humps in the middle. Right? So I'm going to just put a little bit more darkness on these coils here and here and then here. 
and then flip it over and do the same thing. Get this coil in the back here. A lot more of that dark coloring. And just kind of create, you know, that elliptical kind of feel to it. And now you start to see that that glow starts to make more sense now. And believe it or not, the bright stripes that you're seeing are in between the, the coils. Thing over here. Get these. Towards the ends. But darker. If you're careful, you can just kind of drag the brush. Get that curve going that way. There. Pretty easy. You're just working with really tiny, you know, coils. So that's the only big thing is like when you start getting to like plasma pistols and such, the coils themselves are just tiny strips of plastic. I'm using a, a deck cord number two for this entire thing. So it's still a fairly large brush, but it holds a really good knife's edge point. So I'm able to get a lot of work out of it. So it's my go-to brush. I typically use this for everything. I'm digging it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a very, very thin down version of that that I just did. All right, so I'm running out of spots here, but it's like that. All right, so it's not going to give us a whole lot of opacity. And I'm going to do this across the top into the recesses. All right, so I've got the white recesses. The white recesses I don't want quite as bright up top. So I'm going to bring that in real quick. Do the middle here. Kind of hit it back with the brush to make sure it doesn't pool up because it will get really dark if you're not careful. Okay. And we'll just continue playing with that, that real thin pink. May bring it a little over the edge. Some of these. Notice how now my brush stroke is going towards the top. I'm pulling that transparent up top. And that really helps. Now the top is not as white, right? So my glow really does exist down in the lower portion of this whole thing. Booyah! Simple plasma coils. Oh, I don't have any paint on this, do I? Derp. Why are you not smart? Why are you not very bright? Well, I was born this way, thanks. Jeez. We're calling it out, bringing it to everybody's attention. I think that's the way we uplift people these days. I thought we were supposed to be a little bit more polite. Don't just call me dumb. Make us some sense. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of burnt red. I'm 
because a little bit of burnt red will let me darken this, shade this uh, concoction of transparent red and white that I've been dealing with, and give me just a little bit of darkness. that I can work onto the very top of these tubes. You could spot this with mahogany if you wanted, but right now I just kind of want to come in here and very easily kind of tapping the brush across the top of the, the tubes. Just enough to give it that slight halo of darkness across the top. Like you're seeing the thickness of the glass tube, right? The, the glass, glass is see-through, but as it gets thicker, it starts to distort and not let you see through it. So the tubes all cross over the top, right? As we're looking at this side long, those tubes all go this way. And so you're looking through a, a, this width of glass across the top, right? And so we want it to be a little darker right across that halo at the very upper edge of the gun. Bing. Okay. So that sets up the plasma glow. Hopefully that tells a big portion of the story for you. Dad, quick side question. You don't need to show it, but which color would you choose to create the modulation gradient for coal black? I imagine coal black would be the deepest shadows Still learning to pick the correct colors for mixing. So when you when you say modulation gradient for coal black, right? Um, I and what color? Tell me more about what you're trying to do because you could use white, right? Help me understand what it is your goal is because with black, white gives you all the grays in between. So it depends. Are you are you trying to just pick up a color and then do coal black and then spray another color over the top of it? Are you doing airbrush? Are you doing brush blending? Help me help me understand what you're trying to do. Chad Michael Taylor says, I'm miniature rich. <laughs> Aren't we all? If miniatures each counted as a million dollars, we could all just be on a beach someplace and COVID be damned. Oz Pete says, that looks pretty good. I'm beginning to think you may know what you're doing. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Not bad for just a quick little deal. Now we'll do some OSL on it, right? We still have to do the glow of the plasma, right? And that's the hardest part of this whole thing. The easy part and the quick part, once you get it down and you do it a couple times, is this, right? Getting the glow and the, the plasma tube, so to speak, to kind of feel like, you know, they are a light source. This could be a light source. Now we have to, gen we have to do the tough part, which is now create the glow on all the edges of everything around it. And I say the hard part. It's actually easy in its application of paint, as you'll see. It's tough in the determining how dense to go with your paint to make the, the light glow look more like light and less like spilled fruit juice <laughs> is the joke, right? Hopefully I answered your question, Russ. I was painting the raised tubes. It's tough to tell, right? But the, the, the dark parts are the raised tubes. The light, the white is down in between the tubes. Right. If I can get it up here super close and have the camera focus in on it. See? Thank <laughs> you.
Uh, you're trying to make coal black the main color mid-tone by brush, but black's your greatest weakness with making proper shades mid-tone side. Okay, gotcha. You just want to know how to work up black and keep it black. Gotcha. Perfect. Um, so you, we wanted to do kind of a, a dirty gray on this gun, and so I started from like dark grays up into bright gray, right? So I didn't start with black, but the principle will be identical to what I've done here, right? What I would do is this was dark neutral gray. Right, let's back the camera out a little bit so you can see. Right, so just on the gun itself was dark neutral gray as a base, um, and then dark warm gray as your first highlight, light warm gray, or bright warm gray over the top of that. So those three colors give you a dirty gray, right? And you can determine by allowing more of the dark neutral gray to show, that'll make it darker and dirtier, or less of it to show, and that'll make it brighter and more, you know, bright gray or reflective, depending on what surface material you're trying to create, right? So I wanted it to be kind of a, you know, a, a, a carbon fiber gun-ish, right? Um, now, if you introduce coal black into this, you get rid of this most times, and this is where you'll stay, right? And you can do a really good black by having more of your black show. This dark neutral gray becomes your initial highlight, and then your final highlight becomes dark warm gray. And then you might do like bright warm gray as just the pinnacle of brightness if you wanted to to get it to show as as reflective, like Darth Vader's helmet or something. You do like the bright spot up there. Speaking of that, we have like female Darth Vader, I think, right? Is she still here? Oh, there's miniatures falling all, oh, metal miniatures falling all over her. This may or may not be a good thing to show off. But like when doing, you know, like bright spots on this, this is all black and then it's just a little bit of these gray tones in there, right? Working up to the top of the calf muscle here, right? And the spark of brightness down low by the ankle. Right? But there's very little gray. The gray exists in this, you see this little like half moon or quarter moon shape up around there, right? That gives that area where that bright white that I popped in there, it's not white, it's the bright gray, right? That I popped in there looks like white. And then you get those what I call specular highlights, those little bitty glow spots. But you can see how there's very little gray on any of this. You can start seeing the, the, the dark neutral gray kind of right here towards the, the uh, calf muscle as we come out of the black down low, but mostly black left on the model. You're just using those grays towards your highlights to make it look like that's a shiny, but, but it's not, right? That's just a dot of paint on there. It's not, it's not gloss varnish, right? It's just a dot of, of paint on the surface. But so you can see very quickly how the, the way you lose your black is taking your gray too far, right? Whereas on the leg, like these these leg cloths or whatever they are, I've used more of the gray and less of the brightness. So these look like cloth, they don't shine. And so you keep black and black together, but you know, one texture starts, you know, being, uh, look better than the other. That's the, that's the easiest way to show you. The, the big problem with black is everybody uses too much gray. And you really want to leave all your black showing and then just do your gray on your edges and at your very brightest spots, which doesn't make sense because gray, these grays are not super bright colors, but you're using them as your highlights, right? So again, it's one of those that takes your brain and flips it upside down and asks you to do things that are outside of what we've developed as core competencies as painters, right? Black, white, white does the same thing, but in a, in a different manner, um, you don't want to use white Right? With black, you want, to left, you want to leave it looking mostly black, with mostly black paint showing. With white, you don't want to use much white at all. Right? And, and the, uh, the other one that we have is the Stormtrooper, right? or uh, I don't even know if she's here anymore. I feel like she should be, but I don't see her anywhere. Ah, oh, yeah, here. Staring me right in the face. Is the Stormtrooper, right? Because white, this doesn't have any white on it, but it's white armor. Reads as white armor. The same as her shoulder plate doesn't have any white on it, but it looks like white. The same as this guy, right? There's no white on any of these white bits, right? So none of the, the shoulder plate or backpack or face, there's no white there. Bright gray is all we've done. I say no white. There's a tad bit of white, like if you can see those chips that have the brightness on them, those little bitty rinky-dink dots, those are white, right? And the same thing on her, like if we turn it around, right? Butt shot, right? But she's got a little bit of white on the edging of these things to pop out some brightness. But other than that, like all of this is, is all bright gray. So again, it's, it kind of goes against what your brain wants to do. You're like, well, I want to paint white. So I, bring out, I bust out the white paint. And you're like, no, 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 no. Because once you've used white as a layer on your model, you can't go any brighter. 
so you lose the ability to highlight. So with white, you paint it by not using white, and with black, you paint it by letting most of the black be the color on the model and just use the grays as the highlights. So once you, once you get it and you do it once, it becomes much easier and more repetitive to, to just create it, and you get more comfortable with just pushing your gray into the highlights, even though you're, you're not reading it the same way as when you're highlighting, you know, well, hell, you know, like a plasma gun, right? You're not pushing real bright colors into the highlights, and, and you're, you're dealing more in terms of, you know, understanding that even shiny black is dark for 90% of the surface. No. <laughs> you drew that in high school. I drew Darth Vader as a woman in high school. <laughs> Bubbles says, I'm so bad at painting, I'm trying hard, but I think there's a wall I can't breach. So help us out. Like, Bubbles, you're welcome at the right place, because we will help you no matter where you're at. Um, if you ever have any questions with regards to, hey, I'm just not getting it. I don't understand layering. I don't understand shadows and stuff. We deal with that on a fundamental level every day that we paint. We do some advanced stuff or, or you know, what appears to be more advanced stuff, but in in inside of all the advanced techniques that we do are the basics, period. And so I can always focus on the basics for you. So never feel like you are, or hopefully we can get you over feeling like you're up against a wall, right? As long as there's some, there's some key fundamentals for any type of art. And for painting, we always talk about it and knock it down to the base level is that the right amount of color in the right spot is the key to success. And that's really just saying in simplified terms, stay in the lines. If you can paint inside the lines and you're, and we can get your consistency of paint correct so it's not super thick because when your paint's real thick, you see your brush strokes and it looks weird. It gives it a, a texture that you don't like. So if we can get you thin in your paints correctly and then putting the paint in the right place, staying within the lines, boom, you're off and running and you have the kit. You have right there the tools to do everything. It's that simple. Now, that's, that's glossing over the fact that there are very difficult techniques that cause you to have to use the right amount of paint in the right place, and the right place has to be shared with another right amount of paint. You know, you can, get, you can escalate into very difficult things. But it, at its fundamental level, right amount of paint, right place, done. And we can make you spectacular to where you're really, really having fun painting and really enjoying your models for sure. You try highlighting but just looks goofy. You like the lines are way too thick. Yeah, and that's usually what happens like when you're doing edge highlighting is, uh, you know, like when we're doing edge highlighting here, you can find that edge is highlighted, but you don't get the sense of a line of paint necessarily, right? Same on these. And a lot of times the issue is that you go from like a dark base color to a bright color too quickly, right? And and you you get that chunky contrast. It doesn't even mean that your line is very thick, you know, physically thick but because you have a really dark color and then a bright line. Let's see if we can find a model. Uh, what do I has? What has I for this? Maybe, maybe we can just continue using good old Troll Boy. He's been a good, a good demo model here, right? And... Well, this is even a good example because on the bottom here, we were just sketching our highlights real quick. And you can see how we go from a very dark gray to a very bright gray. And so that looks very unnatural. We do that so that we could glaze metallics over it up here. So there's a more advanced process here. But at the basic level, like down here, this looks like a real chunky highlight on that bottom edge because we go from black to white almost. It's not black and it's not white, but it's very, very dark, very, very bright. And you get a big chunky line. And so that looks funky. Right. Whereas something like this edge here is done more in tune with, OK, well, I just want a very thin edge highlight. So sometimes you can overcome it, but also understand that this very thin edge highlight sits next to a brighter gray and then the dark gray. So I've got three colors, dark gray, mid gray, brightness. Here I just have darkness and brightness and you can see how different those look. Right. Even this side with the dark gray, bright gray and or dark gray, mid gray, bright gray around those holes looks better than this side over here where I've got the big chunky highlight that almost gets rid of the light gray and sits next to the dark. So, you know, you're always fighting that issue. But if I just take something and I say, okay, what do I have here on the palette? I have white. I have some white left over. Oh, no, it's all dried. It's all dried, all dried up. I'll put some white. I'll get some white and I'll get some mid-tone gray. Or actually, I do this both with grays rather than white. White's a little ultra garish. So I'm going to get some uh, dark warm gray and, and bright neutral gray. And we're just going to do it over black, right? This is the same for every color you're painting, though, right? It's the, the dark uh, shade of your color versus the bright tint of the color. And finding a way to have your shadows and highlights live together on the model. And usually it means you need a third color. You need a, uh, a mid-tone, right? 
of whatever it is you're painting. Because on him, like on the back here, let's find something. Uh, well, let's just uh, let's just edge highlight like the little wraps on his spear, right? So let's get this out of the way. Right? So he's got all these little wraps on his spear. Bubbles, thanks so much for the follow, and good to have you here, man. So if I just take, right now it's just black primer, right? So if I just take my bright neutral gray, and I say, you know, I just want to highlight these, even if I'm delicate with it, right? If I come in here and just find a way to grab the edges of these straps, using the side of the tip of the brush, I'm not trying to draw them directly on with a like a pencil. I'm generally trying to keep the ang the angle of my brush fairly uh, shallow to the model, right? So you notice how I'm painting like this when I'm doing my lines, as opposed to trying to do like this. If you're trying to paint your edge highlights like this, you will always get too thick of a line until you really get your brush control down, right? Once you're really good with it, you can kind of get your thin lines on here and you can do kind of wispy brush strokes and such. but. It's much easier to do it like this because your hand can follow the shape of the model a lot easier with the, the brush turned on its side than when you're doing this because your hand doesn't want to make this motion. Your hand finds it very hard to put it down and then do a curve right around a surface. Whereas when you hold it sideways, your hand is very naturally creating this motion by rolling the brush. So using the side of your brush is the easiest way to do any kind of edge highlighting. Right? Assuming that, you know, you're doing something like this where you want to just catch the edge. Right? But the second part of this conversation is not just the brush control part, but it's the fact that, okay, now we've got these highlights done, right? But because we didn't put an in-between color there, right, that's never going to look good, right? I, I can't say never. There might be an, a, an opportunity to do something really black or really dark and then a really bright highlight next to it. But the brain is having a hard time distinguishing what's going on because of the garishness, just, you know, uh, of the, the contrast here. Black, white, basically. I mean, it's not white, it's bright gray, right? But it's, it's just goes super dark, super bright. And so the brain sees a bunch of hash marks and loses all the detail in the middle. When you're creating what we call volumes, right? You're trying to make things look three-dimensional. Even though the, the model is already three-dimensional and casts its own shadows, we still have to help it and paint those shadows back on. And so it requires more than just the darkness and the brightness or the base coat and the highlight. And so you have to do a shadow coat. So when I talk in terms of base coat, you'll notice my base coats are super dark. They're, they're basically just like if I'm painting this guy's orange armor, right? right? So our Space Marine is orange. And so if I'm painting the orange armor, I'm starting, well, in this case, we've started with like a dark blue in the shadows, right? Or a dark red. So I start with mahogany. This is the color that this guy was at first, right? This really, really deep brownish red, right? That color. Because that is going to be a representation of my brightest color in the shadows. So I start painting with a very, very dark color that I don't even really, I mean, when I hold this up here, do you see that color on the model much? Not that you can just point at and say, look, mahogany, right? It's not the way I paint. But it is there, and it is influencing the way these colors look in the shadows, like down under his armpit and underneath these armor plates. This shadow here that's underneath his armor is this mahogany as a base. So it just reads really well, and it doesn't show up as, you know, boom, uh, you know, red-brown, because it's not left a lot on here. And that we get into talking about why. But the idea is that if I just did this and then painted the orange over the top of it and the highlights, it wouldn't look as good. I have to find a way to get from my dark shadow color to the top color in a nice smooth way. And, and the way to do that, let's grab this guy again, is by in this case, we just have a black base. What if we did this with some gray, right? We pull this gray over here. So what if we did this with a gray and instead of just base coating the whole thing, what if we then come in with the gray and we just do like the top edges of these, the top surface, not really edges, because I'm not highlighting the edges anymore. I'm coming through and I'm just grabbing the top surface of all this fabric that is the leather here. And I'm leaving a little bit of gap in between each leather fold, right? So I still have that black coming through. I'm not just slopping paint on, right? I'm coming through and I'm saying, okay, I want to just paint gray on that surface there and here and here and these quick brush strokes that are just grabbing each one of these little straps and leaving a little bit of shadow between it and its neighbor, right? And also not going around the side. See that? 
I'm not painting the underside because the underside would be darker. Okay, so now I've got gray real simple across there. Now look at what happens when I go through and I take that same bright gray. Okay. And I want to catch the edge. I don't want to do a little edge highlight. So I'm going to grab the edge here. And again, I'm, I don't really care about how thick it is at this point. Right? But I grab this edge. And I take that edge even maybe down into the shadows on some of these. And there is, I mean, I'm not going to lie, there's some hand control here, right? There's the ability to keep your hands steady, move the paint where you want it to go, you know, keep that, that you do want the paint line to be as thin as you possibly can, but, you know, it, it, you'll learn that, right? That's just practice. Notice how also I don't ever trace the entire line. I'm just doing very small, quick highlights. And get in here, right? something like that. And look at how much different this is, super quick, versus the black with the bright highlight. And I know that you're probably not painting like I was here with black and then immediately into bright white, but the concept is the same no matter the color. If I just take blue, right? So if I just paint a model blue, blue armor for ultramarines, right? And then I go with, say, gray blue, a really bright blue as a highlight, this will suffer the same problem that I just showed you with going from black to, to bright, right? You need to find the color in between. And most of the time, it's as simple as just taking the color that you want for the armor. Say your ultramarine wants to be blue and this wants to be the highlight, then just mix it and you get a color in between. Um, if, you're, if you have that color that's in between, boom, then you can just buy it like sky blue. Right? These are all of our paints. If you're new here, we make these paints. So they're called Pro Acryl and you can find them uh, by hitting exclamation point store. But if you go blue, sky blue, gray blue, this now creates this for you, right? It creates the difference that you get when there's a dark shadow, a mid-tone, and then that highlight doesn't sit right next to a big block of shadow. And so now the brain can distinguish the shape of this model again. And it, it moves away from it being just a bunch of white lines on a black background. And now you can see that this is a cylinder and that those are leather straps or something wrapped around, right? So that's just a very simple way of, of making sure that you're attacking color correctly. You're never going too bright next to too dark unless it's an intent that you have to create a specific effect. Sometimes we do. But in most cases, you want to take a more gradual approach to finding your highlight color. And then that'll, that'll solve 9 out of 10 of your problems with highlighting. And like I said, the rest are generally based around just getting your hand control down to a point where you can pull that line and have it be, you know, it doesn't have to be perfectly consistent, but that it's not super thick, right? Because the thickness of the line just exacerbates the problem that we see. It makes more bright color be next to more dark color. So sometimes the thickness of the line doesn't matter if the color it's sitting next to is the right color, then you can get away with having less of that hand control initially, and then just work on being more delicate and have more, you know, fine control over that line. So. Hope that helps. Ray Silver, new comp. Who dis? What? I'm doing great, man. How are you? Good to see you. What is going on, Ray? Uh, the biggest thing you found at making highlights better was the brush pressure. Took you a long time to realize how little your brush touches the model. Mine hardly touches the model at all, right? When we're doing these kinds of things, that's what allows me to do the kind of edge detailing that we have here with such a big brush, right? Like using a number two, like most people when they go to do their edge highlighting are preferring, you know, like a much smaller brush, right? Something like this or even smaller, right? I mean, we get crazy small. You can imagine taking like, uh, if I can grab it, hello, hand. Would you grab the brush? If all the other brushes would get out, oh my God, this is this is literally like you, this is like right? So it, don't ever feel bad about going with a smaller brush, right? A smaller brush with a much finer point. Just realize the hassles of a small brush include that it doesn't hold near as much paint all the time. So you'll be able to do less painting with each work over at the palette. But this is a great way to start because then you can get in and do very fine lines because the point won't do big lines unless you just, you know, completely press the brush over super hard and flatten it out, right? So small brush for most people is the easiest way to get in and do that, right? Because you've got much less surface area on the brush tip, so you can do much finer lines. Whereas, you know, once you get much broader amount of space, sometimes you feel a little daunted to get that brush in there and do it. But the tip is still the same, 
are very similar, right? The tip is still super sharp, but it does take very, very fine pressure. Like I'm barely ever touching the model when I get in there and do my, my highlighting. And, and that's why today we've talked about consistency of paint, right? Making sure that your paint is just thin enough that on a, on a brush like this, the, tip, the paint at the very tip of the brush is smooth and, and buttery enough to where as soon as you give that light pressure on the model, you get paint. You make it too thin, you give a little bit of pressure and it blots out, right? You get too much paint. You get a thick line that isn't very uh, opaque and it looks like you spilled something on there, right? You get it too thick and when you hit it with the brush, no paint leaves the brush because the paint's too thick and doesn't want to flow. So you have to find that sweet spot. Procryl is really easy to find that sweet spot with just a little drop of water or flow improver, boom, and you're done. But it still takes time and effort because you're going to need different amounts of paint depending on what you're painting, you know? like a line like this little booger here in between these two surfaces, right? Like that upper gray and this lower line here, there's not really a space in between those that's it's negligible. So how do you make that line pull off without getting paint on the upper surface? And that's where you need that, that, that perfect consistency of paint to flow off of your brush, but you'll get it. You'll learn that real quick because the most times you'll go in here, the first time you go in here and you hit this line, right? Your paint will be thick enough that it fills that gap, right? Or it gets on the top piece too. And so you'd be like, ah, damn it. You'll, you'll paint that again with a dark color and you'll go back in with less paint, you know, and maybe it'll be too thick and you pull your line and nothing happens or it's, you know, really scritchy because the paint just kind of comes off in chunks. And so you just have to, you'll get used to it though. As soon as you dial it in and get the understanding of it, it, the light goes off and you're like, oh, I get it now. Finally got whipped to work, but you think the pick is pretty trash for your part. <laughs> the problem is you're a sinner, you use contrast paints. Contrast paints do a lot of what we're talking about for you. That's not a sin, right? So contrast paints create that mid-tone for you if you base it correctly, right? Um, so there's nothing wrong with that, right? They can look a little blotchy and, and you have to work with them and they're a little finicky, but you can do, so they create that kind of, that, you know, that a contrast paint creates the shadow and the mid-tone for you. And then it's just picking maybe not quite so bright a color to go on your edges over that, right? Maybe you have, I don't know what paints you're using uh, and I don't, have, uh, I don't have access nor to a, a knowledge of all the contrast paints. But a lot of times, again, it's just making sure that the color you choose for your highlight isn't so bright compared to your base coat, even when using contrast, you know, or washes and anything like that. The idea that I'm showing you of creating that mid-tone doesn't mean you have to use the mid-tone color paint. You can use washes to achieve that same effect. Uh, contrasts are basically just different types of washes. They're just polyurethane wood stains. Um, you know, so there's lots of techniques that you can do that give you the same function on the model. They give you shadows, mid-tones, and some highlight. The contrast even give you some highlight on the edges. And then if you're going back in and, and amplifying that highlight, just make sure you don't go too bright. I think it's a big thing. Awesome player, Jay. We'll take another st a stab over there in a bit. I want to do some of the glow on uh, Miss Jen's plasmar gun. All right. So now what we got to do is figure out how this glow is going to work. And I need more red transparent, I'm sure, because I've been yapping so long that I guarantee all that's dry. And it is. Get that out there. What we want to do is get that again down super, super thin. And what we might want to do here actually, nah, I think that's fine. I think that's fine. I think we'll just go with the red. I like the idea of the red instead of trying to create a pink glow. I like the idea of the, the base red uh, will get to be sort of a magenta, even though we're not going over a very white uh, base anymore up here. But I want to get this to be super, super thin. So when I'm talking thin, it's like this, right? See that in there? You're not getting much red. So you guys can't even probably tell that I have anything on my brush, right? See that? Barely anything on my brush as far as pigment. There is material on there, so it'll get wet, but not a whole lot of color, right? And I want to start out here and work my brush back towards this edge. So I'm dumping my pigment off at the edge around the area here 
where I've got my glow. Send it out along some of these edges here. Right. See how it's changing color? Just barely, but that's your safety valve when doing this stuff. Always move the brush towards the light source. Thank you for that follow. Welcome, welcome. Why in the paint box? What is happening? All right, so always moving my brush towards my light source because I want to have the bulk of that coloring be in that area. And I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit all this stuff. Why not? I mean, why not? Who's the boss of me? Me is the boss of me. I do what I want. All right. So now I'm starting to alter the coloration across the top there, but I'm doing it in very gradual steps. I don't want to have it be instantaneous red because it'll look like, guess what? I spilled fruit juice on myself, right? And that's not what we're going for at all. But each subsequent layer will add more coloring. All right, so we'll have a little bit of glow down here, but we don't want to go too overboard because this is the brightest spot. So this would actually be more of a white glow down around this edge, right? So we don't want to impede our bright white if we can avoid it. I'll go ahead and bang in a little bit of pink down around here. And I probably want to grab just a little bit on this edge. It's going to look, I think it's going to look really good right here. Although I don't know that that would actually be a thing. But we're going to do it anyway just to show you because this has a little bit more brightness to it. So this will allow us to maybe get a little bit more of that initial pink glow going. Again, I just want to make very, very quick small strokes across the top of this metallic y muzzle that we've created. Going back towards my light source again. But only around this top part. Probably not through the middle, actually, because this sight will block any glow in the middle. We'll really just hit this glare spot here and then stop. Reading for you guys a little bit. You can tell how minuscule amounts of paint I'm actually trying to put on here so that I don't build up too much too quick. Using the transparent red, I'm in a safe zone already basically, right? Because the transparents don't allow me to put a ton of color here as long as I thin them even the smallest amount. But then a second layer, and now I start getting pink on the metal. And go ahead and do a second layer on this part here. Now you're starting to see it. That's a good spot right there. Starting to see that glow build up on these surfaces. But always a good idea to err on the side of way too thin. Um, even if it takes you a while and it gets a little frustrating because you're like, oh my God, you know, I'm just not seeing the color. I want to see the color. I want to see if this works. I get it. But what you don't want to do is, like I said, have it look like you spilled grapefruit juice or grape juice on your model, right? Or in this case, cranberry juice or something, right? Again, I'm just going to take these brush strokes, work them towards my light source. Don't feel like I have any color on the model right now. There we go.
always pushing color towards the light source. If you're not familiar why I make such a big deal about that, it's that wherever you end your brush stroke is where the most paint and color will be left. So if you end your brush stroke in the wrong place, you get color buildup going counter to what your idea was. Right? And we want the bulk of this color to land right around this edge where that light would be the brightest. Start seeing that color build up on there. A little too much. Switch brushes? No. It's that I'm using a palette that is so bumpy that I can't pull paint across it very easily at all. Again, I want to get to the corner. There we go. There we go. Finger blotter. Like I said, we're only going to work on the gun because I'm not ready. I haven't done the edging on her armor, so I can't really do a whole lot with her armor, unfortunately. I would love to show you the glow back on the Space Marine armor here. That would be a great story, and it will happen, but we haven't finished her armor enough to have that be something we can do right now. Probably have some light that we need to put on this thing up here. Smaller and smaller strokes as I get up closer and closer. I'm excited again. Bow and like no tomorrow. Okay. Pretty good. Digging it. Then we take, and you can go more depending on how bright you want this to actually be. Now, I don't want it to be super, super bright. Divorced uncle out on bail. <laughs> I have to laugh. That one's great. Divorced uncle out on bail. Welcome. 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 Hopefully, we can show you a community where the 12-step programs will actually work. <laughs> Thank you a bunch, man. Just showing we got asked how, uh, how plasma glow can be done. And so we're just doing a quick little ditty doing some of this. Now I need more white uh, because now we're going to, again, take the red transparent, mix it with the white paint to get that really hot pink glow. And we're going to do the edge highlighting around these areas that we just pulled the transparent red over. All right. So remember, we've done all of this with two colors, white and transparent red. So it's not hard. It's just getting the combo correct. Uh, we put a little bit of burnt red on there, didn't we? I'd be lying. I'd be lying again. I'm a liar. I put a little burnt red on the top of the coils, right? Think of a little bit of extra darkness there. 
right? But now we need to go through, take a little bit of the red transparent again, put it in the white, get that hot pink, that wow, hot pink. All right, we're back to this now. And we want to edge highlight all these little areas right around the actual opening where the coils exist. So like we talked about earlier, I'm just going to use very, very light brush pressure right around these edges to find them like that. These are weird. They don't really have a good crisp edge. It's like a it's like a bevel. Not like a bevel. It is a bevel. It's a little harder to find. Take a little bit of that out along this spot where it shines up here we are going to go all the way around not like a regular highlight where we normally wouldn't trim out 360 degrees around an area but here we want to and notice how again we've started with a darker color right this isn't the brightest color we'll use on these edges but this will start the story so that we can come back with the brighter color in just a second the brighter color will make all the difference if you do this first. If you just throw a real bright pale pink on this, uh, you're probably not going to be super happy with it. Again, anywhere I have these shine spots that we did when we painted the base colors of the weapon, I'll drag a little bit of this brightness back on those. I did right up here. A little bit right there. I want to keep this edge of this shinier metal on the muzzle bright too. So, There. Same thing on these sides. Sorry, I'm way off center. Kick me under the table. Pretty much having to sketch that line in because the way her arm is, I can't get the side, I can't get the brush side down in there. Like I want to to edge that. We make do.
Now, we may be able to do this with pale pink. We're just going to cheat and go straight to pale pink and stop mixing over on the side. Because pale pink will get us to almost white, right? Uncle Touchy, is that you? <laughs> no, Uncle Touchy's still Uncle Touchy. <laughs> Uncle Touchy's still just Uncle Touchy. I don't understand. We have a new uncle in town. Okay, so this. This works. See if I like this color. You may not like this color. Now I'm looking at it. May not be white enough, but we'll look. I don't find it annoying. I want to try to not use a white is the thing. Right? Now I could go to like super pale. Maybe that's what I need to do. Ah, that's what I need to do. Yeah, I'm just going to mix the... I'm just going to mix. keep mixing the white in there, I think. I think that's going to be the right... The better tool here. pink is meant to be more of a fleshy color and so it has a little bit more of that not quite a real skin tone look to it but a little bit Here's exactly what we've been talking about all night long, is getting the consistency of the paint right. Paint was a little too dry. It wasn't flowing off the tip correct. And i got to be careful because then you may overcompensate and get it too thin, which right now would be a real bummer. Because too thin isn't going to give us, like that, isn't going to give us what we need. What is going on over here? Help me out, paint. That's better. Works like a champ. 60% of the time, it works every time. Aha, the reason is that I'm out of white.
Or one out for Uncle Touch. Well, I mean, nobody's seen him for a while. He's he's stranded at home like the rest of us, right? I've been talking to him a lot on the phone. Been having to talk to him a lot on the phone. He plays our attorney on television. This should do the trick. All right, Paint. Don't let me down. I just spoke good things about you. It's going to let me down. Too thick. I talk like it's the paint's fault, right? Like the paint's over on the palette conspiring. Paints, they're conspiring. Like it's not the paints. It's the user of the paints. I take full responsibility. I don't like to. I'd like to be able to blame you guys. But in this case, that's a little rough. Oh, oogly moogly. Come on now. The air conditioner is blowing. Stirring up the air right on my paint. There we go. Take my mic off. Okay, fool, Mike. All right, there we go. Very scary, that pink on the end of the thing there. Now we've got that Nice dull glow. Jen's learned how to turn her plasma coils on. Now we can extend this out further without having to adjust any of the hard work that we did on the coils themselves. We can constantly, like if we wanted the coils to be glowing brighter, uh, which once we get the armor done, we'll get a feel for that because this pink glow will come up and hit like her chest area and the, uh, the inside of her arm and pauldron here. Wild Man Vol, 20 freaking months. What is going on? Right. But right now, since we don't have the armor done, I just wanted to keep it to a dull glow around the weapon itself. Because the easiest way to keep it reading is to make sure that the eye and the brain are registering that, you know, the glow that I'm seeing wouldn't go further out on the model right now. It's really just kind of encapsulated to that area right surrounding right, the opening for the tubes all this gunk off so you can actually have the camera see the brightness correctly there we go right. so a little bit of non-metallic for us a little bit of that dull carbon fiber on the the base body and hardware and then the the kind of you know iron steel silver whatever on all these other doohickeys we had to do that, get all that finished and highlighted the way we want it so that we can follow in with all of the glazing of the red transparent once we get the coils done. 
and I tend to really like the way this looks versus some of the other methods for plasma, but all of them are valid, right? There's the, the take the, uh, um, you know, do the, the in this case, like a, a you know, a, the dark pink kind of on the center and then build towards a spot of brightness somewhere along the length of the tubes and have that brightness exist as kind of a pulse. You know, that works well too. I kind of like this because it, it, it tells a better story in a very small area and works as well on pistols as it does on rifles and everything. Whereas on a pistol, the little pulse glow is really hard to fit in that really small area and get it to look good. Right, this you can do on any size plasma gun at all. Right. So hopefully that helps. That, uh, that was good content for today, I think. More so because we got to spend some time doing the body of the gun as well and not just the actual oil glow.